Hey you guys, it's great to have you here this morning. Let's go ahead and take out our Bibles and uh, we're going through the book of Mark and uh, we're coming to the end of Mark now, coming into that final phase of the life and ministry of Jesus here on the earth. And of course, he's getting to that point where they're, they're just about to capture him and uh, take him to see the Sanhedrin so that they can have a, a crazy mock trial, convict him of the things they want to convict him of, whether they have any proof or not, and then to... Uh, pronounce a death sentence upon him. And that all starts in the Garden of Gethsemane when Judas comes up and gives him a peck on the cheek there and says, hey, this is the guy, take him. And so that's what we're looking at today. But at the same time that trial is going on, the trial of Jesus, the trial of Peter is going on as well. As Peter has come to that place of saying, Lord, I'll, I'll go to prison with you, I'll go to death with you if I have to, but I'll never deny you. But we'll find that uh, Peter fails in that greatly here today as uh, finally they confront him. Hey, are you one of the ones that was hanging around with Jesus? Oh no, not me, not me. I, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. And so there's some great lessons in there for us. And so we'll begin here today looking at chapter 14, verse 43. We're going to cover a lot of verses, so I'm not going to read through it like I normally do. We'll just cover the first uh, couple of verses here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 43, And immediately... While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and, and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they said, then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the life and ministry of Jesus, Lord, and and for you sending your only son to die for our sins. We thank you, Lord, that he took upon those stripes for us. He took that beating for us. He took upon that betrayal for the forgiveness of our sins, for the remission of our sins. Lord, we are eternally thankful. Lord, we ask that you would just help us to understand these things here today. In your word, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this is is all going on very late at night. You remember the disciples had met Jesus in the upper room and they had that great time of, of ministry as Jesus washed their feet and told them about how to be a servant and, and instituted the Last Supper, the, the Lord's Supper with them. Uh, the new covenant in his blood for the remission of their sins and and just went on to tell them incredibly uh, deep, profound truths about his love and his father's love for them there in that upper room on the last night of his life. And so this went on well into the night and then they went up to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where we left off last week. And so in this garden, they are there and Jesus is praying as great drops of blood as he as he comes to this place of realizing how close he is to this trial of being crucified. And in that place, he's telling his disciples, now watch and pray, you know, lest you enter into temptation. Because there's a great trial coming in your lives as well as in my life. And so you need to be prepared for that. So pray. But you remember the disciples, yeah, it's late. <laughs> it's time to go to sleep. And they took that time that they should have been preparing and they used that time to sleep. And now that trial has come. Now that point of of the the betrayal and uh, trial of Jesus has come and they're not prepared. And so there's a trial that, that Peter will be confronted with here tonight. Well, the whole thing is a real sham trial. And you know, I was thinking about the fact that Our Capitol building, the lights are always on. I don't know if you knew that or not. There's always somebody there at the Capitol building. The lights are always on. And and that's not just...
people trying to get work done, oftentimes they're there passing laws in the middle of the night uh, just so they can sneak them by the opposition party. They, they have these times where they, and both sides do it, you know, they, they bring a bill up that they know could never get passed. And then in the middle of the night, when there are only a certain amount of Democrats and a certain amount of Republicans there, and they know they can pass the bill if they take a vote right then and there, that's when they, they slip it by. And it reminded me of kind of this, this sham trial that Jesus is going through. They're doing these things in the middle of the night. They capture Jesus around midnight and they haul him away. And he's there in the house of Caiaphas and in that courtyard area being tried and convicted in the middle of the night. It's one o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the morning that these things are going on because the, the cock crows at three o'clock in the morning. The first time the cock crows is three o'clock in the morning and that's when Peter will do his final denial of Christ. And so all these things are, are very shady, going on behind the scenes. The general public doesn't know about it. If they knew about it, they'd never let it happen because truly they saw Jesus as a great prophet. They saw Jesus as a great man. And, and if they knew what was going on in the middle of the night, they would have had a big uproar. And, and we've seen that in, in the book of Mark, uh, the chief priests knew that. And they said, hey, we got to do this not during the... the the uh, Passover time because it'll create a huge uproar because the people do see him as a prophet and maybe even as the Messiah. Well, Jesus himself says here in John 3.18, he who believes in him, talking about himself, talking about the Son of Man, the third person here, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And that's why people sneak around to do the things they do. At night. That's why the chief priests and the, and the high priest are doing these things in the middle of the night. Because their deeds are evil. And they don't want them to be seen by the light of the day. Well, it really shows you how far the nation of Israel has come. I mean, at the very beginning, God wanted to show them that He was a God of justice. That He was a God of truth. That He was a God of righteousness. And He says here in Deuteronomy 10... For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. God is righteous. God is just. And he wanted his people to be righteous and just. And he told them that. Going on in Deuteronomy a little bit later, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates. For the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. That's the kind of people that I want you to be. I want you to be righteous. I want you to appoint judges that are not corrupt, that won't take bribes, but they'll administer the justice that needs to be administered in this nation so that this nation will be a righteous nation. But you look at how far they've come from that. They've come so, so far from that because they are completely unjust. They have a a racketeering kind of thing going that we've talked about. Uh, The money changers tables, charging exorbitant prices for for offerings and those kind of things. And of course now trying people in the middle of the night. The Jews had, because of this verse and verses like it, they had developed an outrageously complex legal system uh, for that time period. 
uh, in which, you know, they had all kinds of rules to make sure that people weren't going to be judged unrighteously. Things like, we're not going to try people in the middle of the night. We're going to make sure that we've got two or three witnesses and their witnesses agree with each other. Their testimonies agree with each other. Those kind of things. All that stuff on the night that we're talking about tonight was thrown right out the window. Because they said, we can't let this guy rule over us. He's going to take away our power. He's going to take away our place. He's going to take away our authority with the people. And people will go to him. We've got to take this guy out or he's going to destroy us all. And that's the unrighteousness that was going on there. Well, again, as we go back over this and and look at a few more verses here, what we're going to find first is the trial of Peter and then also a little bit later the trial of Jesus. And we're going to break it up a little bit because Mark kind of... uh, talks about it as it's all going on at the same time. So we'll we'll kind of walk through it a little bit here. Well, going back and looking, the first thing that we find there is is Jesus actually being taken. And uh, you have Judas coming, and and he's already set this up ahead of time. He knows where Jesus is going to be. If you look in the book of John, John tells us that Judas knew that Jesus went to that place in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, okay, I know how I can you know, betray him in a, in a way that we can capture him and, and not a whole lot of people will see it. Uh, he goes over to that garden and prays and so we'll get him then. And that was his plan. And he told the guards, when I go up and kiss him, that's the guy. You'll know that that's the guy because he's the one that I kiss. And so you see there, as soon as he had come in verse 45, immediately he went up to him and he said, Rabbi, Rabbi means master. You notice he didn't call him Lord because certainly Jesus wasn't his Lord. He was not submissive to Jesus at all. He calls him master or rabbi, which is teacher. And that's, that's kind of the idea there. But then he kisses him. What a, what a slap in the face. What an incredible slap in the face that Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. I mean, it's about the lowest thing you can do. You know, if you're going to be a little worm, a a little snake, you know, just betray me and get out of my face. You're going to come right up to me and kiss me and that's the way you're going to betray me? Oh, it's just incredible. Just like Satan to do something like that though. But I want you to see in this entire passage that we're going to look at today, the contrast between Jesus and his knowledge of the situation, the peace that he has in the situation the, the complete control over, over what he is saying and, and doing, and then the contrast between what happens to the disciples as they are just scattered, and they, they run off, and they follow at a great distance, and, and they're double-minded. You know, they have this zeal to do the right thing, but they don't have the knowledge to back it up, and they don't have the ability within themselves to stay strong throughout the whole process. But the contrast between Jesus and and the disciples all the way through, not just what we're looking at today, but all the way through to the very end. It's incredible. And it's done because, you know, these disciples are not filled with the Holy Spirit yet. They haven't come to that place of being filled with the power. And that's why Jesus tells them a little bit later on down the road, don't leave Jerusalem. I want you to go out and I want you to tell the whole world, but don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power. Until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're not going to be able to go out and do anything. You'll fail just like you did over there in the Garden of Gethsemane. You'll fall right on your face. Your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. And that is the the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Well, it's incredible what Jesus says here to the mob that is coming to him in verse, um, verse 47, one of those who stood by, drew his sword um, and struck off the servant of the high priest, uh, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But this is something we don't see within the text today. Jesus asked them, you know, when he comes up and kisses him, uh, Judas does. Jesus says to the mob that are coming to take him, the guards, whom do you seek? And what we find in another gospel, the gospel of John Chapter 18, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Whom are you seeking? And their response, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. 
Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. The power that came out of Jesus' mouth because of the words he said. It's very important that we see this. When it says, I am he there, that he is added into the text to make it flow in in English. To make it flow and, and make it make sense in English. But what Jesus really said was, I am. And of course, that's what we find in the book of Exodus. When God reveals himself to Moses. When God reveals himself to Moses and, and, and says, I want you to go down to Egypt and I want you to tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. And when he finally gets him to that place of saying, okay, I'll go. He says, well, who should I tell them is sending me down here? And he said, you tell him the I am. I am. I'm everything is, is kind of the name of God. I'm everything. I'm the becoming one. I'm everything that you need me to be. God is everything. And that's why he goes by that title. I am. What are you? I am. I'm everything. And that is exactly what Jesus said. And that is exactly why they fell down because of the power coming forth from Jesus. I am. Poof. Now, some commentators say there might have been as, as many as a thousand people coming out at this point to try to capture Jesus. And they all fell down backwards. That's the kind of power that God has. A very small glimpse of that power. As Jesus himself identifies himself with the God of the Old Testament that revealed himself to Moses. I am. And they all fell down. That would be enough for me. I don't know about you. I ain't messing with this guy. I'm out of here. You have to pay me more money than that to try to capture this guy. We're gone, you know. But whom are you seeking here today? Are you seeking a nice, mild-mannered carpenter's son that has some good moral teachings? Or are you seeking the great I am today? I hope that's the kind of Jesus that, that you have in your mind when you think about Jesus and following Jesus. He's the great I am. He's God in the flesh. Is that who you're seeking today? Or are you seeking the, the kind of mamby-pamby uh, Jesus that you might have learned in Sunday school, you know, that holds his hand in a certain way and has this glowing thing over his head or something, you know? He is God in the flesh. And that's who you should be seeking. Because that's how he's going to return to this earth. Well, Jesus, you know, Peter is the guy who pulls out this sword and wants to chop the ear off or chop the head off of the uh, the servant of the high priest. You know, Peter wasn't trying to get his ear, right? You, you know, he wasn't, okay, if I could just get his ear, he'll stop attacking Jesus. No, you know, Peter, ah! I mean, he's going for his head. He wanted to take this guy's head off and the guy must have moved just in time. But Jesus says, hey, put your sword away. Peter, and we know it's Peter. Who else would it be, really? I mean, who else? John 18, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck off the uh, priest's servant, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put away your sword into your sh- the sheath. Uh, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? I'm going to go through with this, Peter. This is all foretold in Scripture. This is what I've been telling you guys for months. I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me. They're going to kill me. And then I'm going to rise again. That is what has to happen, Peter. That's God's plan. That's my Father's plan. Put away your sword. You're not going to stop what God has to do here. And this isn't the first time. You know, uh, one time Jesus told him that before. and, And Peter said what? No way, we're not going to let that happen to you, Jesus. No way, we're going to let you go down there. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking about the things of God, you're thinking about the things of men. You're thinking about saving your own tail. But that's not what we're here about. We're here to do the will of the Father, to accomplish His will. And we're never going to get through this whole study here today. But that's okay. We'll get through the trial of Peter. I'm just rambling on here. It's all right. I have to drink that cup, Peter. I prayed tonight. Father, if there's any other way, 
but not my will. Your will be done. I've got to take that cup, Peter. I've got to drink that cup because that's my Father's will. And that's the only way that all of mankind can be redeemed is if I do this. And so stand back and just let it happen. Put your sword away. Well, it's so sad to see what happens as all of the disciples take off. They all leave Him. It says there in verse 50, they all forsook Him and fled. Just a few hours ago, we'll never leave you. We'll never leave you. If we have to go to prison, if we have to go to death, we'll not deny you, we'll not leave you. Yeah, 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 we all agree. Didn't they? They all agreed. Along with Peter. We won't deny you. Question here for you today. Have you forsaken Jesus? Now, you're here in church, so you might be saying, well, no, I'm here in church. But when the going gets tough in our walks with the Lord, you know, we might experience early on in our in our walks with the Lord a, a real, you know, just kind of levitating off the ground and these good, you know, feelings of, you know, God loves me and my sins are forgiven. Boy, I just want to serve Him. And, and then you get into ministry a little bit. You, you wade into the waters of ministry and you go, ooh, it's kind of dangerous out here. And you get hurt. And you... Uh, you kind of sense, maybe I should just follow at a distance. Maybe I should just back away a little bit. Following Jesus too closely, hmm, boy, that, that kind of gets me in trouble sometimes. That kind of hurts my flesh. I have to deny myself a little bit too much when I follow Jesus too closely. Have you encountered that? I know I have. It does hurt the flesh. Flesh don't like it. The flesh wants to back up a little bit. Okay, I still see Jesus. He's still down there. I'm keeping him in my sights. I'm not losing him. I still believe in him. I mean, I'm here at church. But we kind of forsake him a lot of times in that way. Even though we haven't denied him with our mouth, we still follow at a distance. Because it's dangerous being too close to Jesus. He's radical. He's a radical individual. And the world doesn't like his radical ways. They don't accept his radical ways. Now, they accept his nice moral teachings, but all the radical stuff, they want to cut it out. And they want to say, that part of the Bible is not inspired. He didn't really do those things. He didn't really do the, oh, I like that part. I like, yeah, that's who Jesus is. That's the Jesus I follow. But the real Jesus... You've forsaken. And you're following some false Jesus at a distance. You've got to take his whole word, his whole counsel, the real Jesus, who he really is, and you've got to follow him very closely, regardless. He says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to deny yourself. I was thinking about what Keith Green sang. I was sharing this song with somebody the other night at Wednesday night and I kept thinking of it. I couldn't remember the words and, and it just really fit well with today's message. Keith Green had a, a huge impact on me. He was a young believer. But in that song, he writes, Lord, I remember that special way I vowed to serve you when it was brand new. But like Peter, I can't even watch and pray one hour with you. And I bet I could deny you too. I bet I could deny Jesus. In fact, I know I could. And I have. Because it hurt the flesh. What are my friends going to think of me? What are people at work going to think of me? What's my family going to say if I start acting like a Jesus freak all the time? What's the world going to think if I start acting that way? If I start following too close to that man, that radical man, what's the world going to say? He goes on there, though, he says, but nothing lasts except the grace of God by which I stand in Jesus. Nothing lasts except the grace of God. And I never really understood exactly what he was saying about that till just recently. 
But as he talks about in the top there, that special way I vowed to serve you. You know, that zeal. The Spirit is willing. I want to serve you, God. That doesn't last. And we come to those places of weakness. And the the emotion that we had and the feelings that we had, they've gone away. And now what's left? God's grace. That's it. Nothing lasts except the grace of God. Because long after my excitement has worn off, long after that feeling of exhilaration, long after I have begun to serve Him and had some great fulfilling moments in ministry and and have felt the touch of the Lord as I've served Him, long after those things, as it becomes a grind and and I get tired in the ministry or I get tired of, of walking such a strong way and tired of reading His Word all the time, God's grace is still there. And when I fall flat on my face, that net is there to catch me. And that's what God's grace becomes to us. It becomes a net. After we have become saved by His grace, now it becomes a net that catches us when the flesh finally gives out. It becomes that net that that holds us and wraps His loving arms around us and says, I know. I know you failed again. It's all right. Get back up. Begin to walk again. Begin to follow me again. It's okay. It's all right. God's grace. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Well, we followed Peter here. If you skip on over to verse 66... And the intervening verses are Jesus in that interrogation time with the high priest. But at the same time those things are going on, Peter has been following at a distance, but he followed just close enough to get inside the gate before they close that gate in the courtyard. Now, we can dog Peter out, can't we? We can make fun of Peter. We can use the bathroom during the worship service and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we can make fun of Peter though. It's easy to do. You know, you imagine him this big burly fisherman and, and putting his foot in his mouth and all those kind of things. But this guy had a zeal and a passion to follow God that rivaled all of the disciples and I would dare to say it rivals all of us as well. And so we can dog him out, but man, I want to be more like Peter. I want to have that passion to follow him. That zeal. Even though he fell, even though he failed, he still had the desire to be inside that courtyard with Jesus. He went behind those enemy lines, knowing that there was a possibility that he would be noticed. Because he wanted to be close to his Savior. He wasn't as close as we'd like to see him. He wasn't as close as I'd like to be. But he still made it into that courtyard. But look what happens to him there. Now as Peter, verse 66, was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and when she saw Peter warming himself, excuse me, she took a look She looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to, uh, began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them. For you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. The second time, the rooster crowed. 
Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And, he, and when he thought about it, he wept. No kidding. And so, poor Peter here. Such zeal. Such desire. Such passion to, to be alongside of Jesus. But he just doesn't have the power to carry it through. And the first thing we think about here, you know, well, why did he fail? Well, he didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit working in his life, first of all. But he, he did have the words of Jesus telling him exactly what he needed to be doing last night, a couple of hours ago, when you were sleeping. Man, Peter, you should have been praying. You should have been praying, asking God to give you that power that you needed to make it through. And as we talked about last week, you know, the moment to pray about overcoming a temptation isn't when that temptation is thrown in your face. You've got to be living that life that is is continually asking God every day, Father, give me the power. As you wake, reading His Word, God, give me the ability to walk this walk that You've called me on. Father, fill me again with Your Holy Spirit so that I can be a diligent servant today, so I can live my life for You, so that I won't fall flat on my face again. Help me. And going through the day, you know, the Bible says that we should be praying constantly. I'm guilty, so guilty of not adhering to that. There are times in my life that I, you know, really tried to do that. You know, just be praying little prayers all day long. And sometimes it's just difficult to do because of work and the things you're doing. But, you know, it's really a neat time when you're able to do that. When the Lord is working in your life. But I think another problem that Peter definitely had was that he had a confidence in the flesh, didn't he? He was confident in the fact of just saying, I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to deny you. I don't need to pray. I'm just going to sleep. I need my rest tonight and, and I'll be able to make it through this trial in the morning. But the Bible is very clear that this is the betrayer right here. I'm the betrayer of myself. I'm the betrayer of Jesus. This flesh, this body that we ride in, it is the betrayer. It is the one who will listen to the temptations of Satan and say, yes, I'll take that rather than what God is offering me. I'll take that rather than obeying what I know I should do because that'll make my flesh feel good. That'll make my flesh satisfied. And it doesn't. It never does. Flesh is never satisfied, is it? Never. It can't be satisfied. But it's that lie that Satan tells us. If you just take a little bit of this, do a little bit of this, hang out a little bit here, you'll be satisfied. You'll be fulfilled. But it's the lie. No confidence in the flesh. Paul says... In Philippians 3.3, we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We cannot be confident in our own ability to walk the walk, to talk the talk, to be a Christian, period. We just can't do it. The flesh is unable to do it. And we can't redeem it, we can't reform it in any way. We cannot rely on upon our flesh. It will deceive us. It will betray us every time. Another problem that we see in the life of Peter here is he's warming himself by the enemy's fire. (laughs) And that's often been spoke about in this passage, you know, that uh, what are you doing by the enemy's fire? You're taking comfort in the world, in a sense. You know, if he's in that courtyard and wanting to do something about Jesus... Hanging out over at the enemy's fire is is not getting him anywhere, is it? Don't warm yourself by the enemy's fire. I love what uh, Peter says here. Luke 22 says, Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. And so... 
we get a picture here that Peter was close enough to Jesus and in the vicinity of Jesus where he could be, you know, maybe looking between some trees, looking through a window or something, or looking up. I guess he was probably looking up because he said it was, he was down below. But he was close enough to where as soon as that rooster crowed, Jesus was able to look over at him. And I don't think it was a look of disgust. I don't think it was a look of anger. We don't know what kind of look it was, but boy, that must have cut. Whatever look that Peter received from the Lord must have been devastating. I've just denied him, just like he said I was going to. But you know, Jesus had told Peter, I prayed for you, Peter. I prayed that your faith won't fail. Your flesh is going to fail. There's no doubt about that. But I prayed that your your faith won't fail. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. He wants to shake you up and find out if there's anything there. If there's any anything of worth there. You say you believe in Jesus. You say you're a follower of Jesus. Satan wants to shake that up and find out if it's really true. But I prayed for you, Peter. And I know that when you return to me, that's the kind of language Jesus used. When you return to me, you go strengthen your brothers because they're going to be in a miserable state as well after their failure, after they took off, after they forsook me and ran. He's also sitting here with the scoffers and I wanted to look at uh, Psalm 1-1 for just a minute because we have this great illustration in Psalm 1-1 about... Two different men. One who sits by the enemy's fire. One who sits with the sinners and hangs out with the sinners. And his life is an absolute wreck. But then the blessed man who walks with the Lord and seeks after the Lord. He's like a tree planted by the waters. And there you see in verse 1 of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. But whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so you see that contrast there between someone who hangs out with the sinners, takes counsel from the sinners, is just involved in the world, warming themselves by the fire, comforting themselves by the fires of the world, getting their counsel from the world. Between that person and the person who gets his counsel from God. A very different end. And and it's very vivid here as the ungodly are like chaff. And that's exactly the kind of picture that Jesus was giving us about Satan wanting to sift Peter as wheat. The chaff, I want that chaff to blow out of there and see if there's anything left. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. But Peter is in that place, getting too close to the world and not close enough to Jesus because he feels that it would hurt his flesh. So going back over to Mark, What do we find there? Well, the last point I wanted to point out here is don't be ashamed to profess Jesus as your Savior. You know, it is hard in the world. And and you see exactly how hard it is when a big burly fisherman can't even confess to a little servant girl that he's a follower of Jesus. And, you know, I don't know how many times in my own life where I've had an opportunity to witness to somebody on an airplane, uh, 
you know, I was in the military and I, I was on watch with people two, three, four o'clock in the morning and, you know, you have, there's nothing to do. You stand there watching airplanes that aren't doing anything and uh, you got hours and hours and hours to kill. And you're talking about football and you're talking about this and that and this and that. But I don't know how many times I just never brought up the Lord. I always wanted to, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it because I knew that that guy was going to go back and tell everybody at work tomorrow what a Bible thumper I was, what a Jesus freak I was. It would hurt my image. I don't want everybody to think I'm a Jesus freak. And we deny Jesus in that way. They asked him that question, well, surely you're one of them. I mean, your speech betrays you. You sound like a Galilean. We know you're from Galilee because you sound like you're from Galilee. Can people see that in our own lives? Can people see that we are a follower of Jesus by the way that we act, by the way that we talk, by the way that we conduct our lives? Can people point that out? I've I've seen it in other people. I don't know that anybody's ever seen it in me and said anything about it. But there's been people that just something about the way they acted, something about the way they talked. I thought, you're a Christian, aren't you? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I am. (laughs) Awesome testimony, man. That is an awesome testimony. When somebody can tell that you're a believer. Not because you're speaking Christianese all the time. Oh, bless the Lord. God bless. Blah, blah. You know, I mean, just, you know, just a contrite spirit and and just a godly way of acting. Do we profess the Lord in that way? Are we ashamed of Him? Are we ashamed to profess Him? Are we ashamed to align ourselves with Him? Are we ashamed to say, yes, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'll go up there to Rome and I'll tell everybody. What did Jesus say about being ashamed of him? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers of the whole and of the holy angels. Wow, that's pretty powerful. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. That's what Jesus says. That's pretty powerful. Well, the last thing I want to look at here, I think we have five minutes. We can get through this. All right, we're going to finish. So going back to verse 55, meanwhile, back in the courtyard, kind of a thing, Meanwhile, back at the chief priest's house in verse 55 of chapter 14, now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore witness against him, and their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands. And within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimonies agree, or testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent, and he answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, of the power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How do you think? What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. And so now it's really come to that place where Satan has just taken over this whole situation. 
Jesus will be humiliated. He will be spit upon. He will be beaten mercilessly. They put a hood over his head or a blindfold over his head, you know, and, and that's, you know, if you, if you know a punch is coming, you're, you're kind of able to absorb that punch a little bit. But they would deliberately put a, a blindfold over their heads so they couldn't see where the punches were coming from. And it became a little game to them. Oh, you're a prophet? Come on. Prophesy. Who's going to hit you next? Who hit you then? And Jesus is not able to brace himself for those incoming punches. And so he was beat mercilessly. His visage or his face was marred to the point of he didn't even look like a man, the Bible says. It was a vicious thing, and, and again, this is going on at one o'clock in the morning. Against every one of their laws that they had put in place to make sure that somebody was tried honestly and justly and righteously, all that stuff was thrown out the door when they tried Jesus. It was a very inhumane thing that they did to him. But, again, Jesus said, let the scriptures be fulfilled. The scriptures must be fulfilled. And they say in Isaiah 53, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. A deafening silence. Why won't you answer these people? As they brought a false witness and another false witness and none of their testimonies agreed. And it's almost as though Jesus said, there's nothing to answer. I'm not going to answer false witnesses. They don't even agree with each other. So he didn't say anything until that one very important question was asked. Jesus kept silent and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. What did Jesus say? You said it. I am. Again. I am. I am the Son of God. It's as you say. And not only that, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power, the Heavenly Father. And then you'll also see Him coming in the clouds of glory. It is as you say, I am. Again, using that word, that name, that God Himself used to reveal Himself to Moses. Well, the last thing we'll look at here, he did this voluntarily for you. He went through these things for me, for you, for us. It should be the place that we sat, being judged for our own sins, being held on trial for our own sins. We're the guilty ones. Jesus never did anything wrong. He was an innocent lamb sent to the slaughter for you and I. He did them voluntarily for us. And, you know, as we go through and look at the crucifixion and, and these things, I, I really want you to, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, boy, I wish you'd tell a, a happy message one of these days because this is really bringing me down. You know, it, it should bring you down but it should lift you right back up when you realize what He has done for us so that we didn't have to go through this. He did it for us on our account. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it, uh, but it was very necessary that Scripture may be fulfilled. He did it voluntarily for your and my salvation. We're going to close with Hebrews 12. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, speaking about the the hall of faith in that 11th chapter of Hebrews, talking about the old uh, patriarchs and all the things they did by faith. Since we're surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy. 
What joy does Jesus have looking forward to the cross? The joy of having each one of us spend all of eternity with Him and His Father in heaven. That's the joy that He was looking forward to and that's the joy that you and I are to be looking forward to as we think about what He's done on our behalf and what that means for all of the eternity future. He endured that cross for us, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who endured... Again, that word endured, it's used many times in this passage. He endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. The next time that you come to that place, as Keith Green sang in the song, discouraged, weary in your soul, weary in the service of the Lord, weary in your walk, Think about what Jesus has done for you. Think about the joy he had going up to the cross and and enduring the cross itself that he might have eternal life prepared for you and I. Don't be discouraged about what Jesus went through. He's not discouraged about it. He's waiting there with open arms for us on account of what he's done. Amen?